Good morning. I see this is blank, so I'll, I'll have to watch this one. Um, yes, so we're at the Luster Administrators and Developers uh, workshop, and today I'll uh, cover some topics uh, related to administrators. Um, after short introduction, I, I want to talk about two subjects which are um, not so much related, but are both in, in the monitoring area. Um, one is uh, how visualizing an InfiniBand fabric can help us understand performance, and the other one is how um, we think, or a proposal actually, on how we could integrate cluster and luster metrics to, to try to learn more about jobs, about the performance of jobs uh, of users. So I'm um, working for NEC. NEC is a 115-year-old company uh, based in Japan with 100,000 employees. We have business activities in 140 countries. Uh, one of them is Germany. Uh, my business unit is NEC HPC Europe. We are part of NEC Deutschland. We have offices in Düsseldorf, Stuttgart, and Paris. Uh, we sell scalar clusters. We sell parallel file system solutions and storage. Um, we sell, again, vector systems, the SX Ace, um, and solution services. And we also do uh, a little bit of research and development uh, over here in Europe. Um, our part of the business is um, uh, within the system platform business unit. Uh, that's the lower left side of this big segment circle. Um, the parallel file system product um, is called LXFS. It is built with Luster. We do this since 2007, so since uh, Luster won six times. Um, this is a parallel file system solution integrating validated hardware. So servers, uh, networks, high performance storage. Uh, it contains deployment management uh, and monitoring software. It comes in two flavors. Uh, the standard flavor built with a community edition luster. Currently, this is version 253. And the enterprise edition built with Intel uh, enterprise edition for luster software where level three support comes from Intel. Um, each of the, um, well, one of these, uh, each of these LXFS setups comes in blocks. Blocks are configured as appliances. The blocks contain two HA servers and storage. Um, the entire cluster storage um, Storage cluster configuration is in one place. It's, uh, the component is called LX Daemon. This is a kind of a hierarchical database. Uh, it describes the setup and the hierarchy of the system, uh, contains all the configurable parameters, and I'll show later it, it also uh, provides a kind of a proxy to, to uh, other hierarchies uh, that uh, it can take out data from. Uh, this is a single data source used for deployment, management, and monitoring. Deploying this storage cluster is very easy and, and reliable. That's really the point where we are uh, very strong, and we, we generate all configurations for all components, uh, configure and build, actually build the storage devices, set up the configuration, uh, the server set up, uh, the HA services, uh, dependencies, Stoneth, formatting luster, mounting luster, everything's just just flowing to the target of the uh, ready-to-go to system. Of course, we provide this with, with management and monitoring tools. Um, an example of such a block is uh, with this one. This is an optimized o OSS block. Uh, the specs of this uh, are um, over six gigabytes a second write performance, over seven and a half gigabytes per second read performance. Um, the, the capacity, uh, well, that's, that's for smaller drives. We can do more today in, in uh, ATU storage. These are uh, high-density storage devices, um, 
built with uh, NetApp E5500. We OEM the storage, and those are the NEC names of the products. Um, testing those, so this, this is a test from, from the beginnings of this, uh, of this product. Um, the, the graph in the lower right side shows performance um, of such an OSS block in a noisy environment. That means uh, it was built in a data center and set up in a data center where a lot of other jobs were running on the InfiniBand fabric around this, uh, this server. It was not fully configured. It has only uh, 80 uh, nearline SAS drives uh, instead of 120. And what you can see is uh, with plain IOR, you see uh, something close to 5,500 uh, megabytes per second write performance and in excess of 7,000 megabytes a second uh, read performance. Integrated in a data center, that, that was our first deployment of the E5500 based um, uh, Luster solution. Um, well, the task was integrate it into a data center and automotive uh, companies uh, set up. Um, the compute nodes uh, in that uh, company are arranged in high bandwidth islands. Uh, there are some 3,000 nodes um, there um, put in blocks of um, roughly, let's say, three racks. I plotted here three racks. It's not, not always three racks, uh, which all have a pretty fat InfiniBand network, the racks, but are connected upwards to the top level switch um, rather thinly through only four QDR links. So um, um, th that is OK for the company, because their simulations are uh, uh, of limited size, and they run always within one of these islands, so each of the jobs. Uh, so, so the easiest way to connect, to hook this up, was, was to just connect the Luster storage um, in, in, uh, well, into the top level switch. And if you look at the specs of the wires and all this, it, it looks sufficient. So we were expecting more than 20 gigabytes a second aggregated bandwidth from, this, from the file servers and uh, connected it with, uh, with 12 QDR links uh, worth 48 gigabytes a second. You would say that's enough. But uh, well, it was not that easy to demonstrate the performance. And now we tried to find out why. So we had to check all layers. And uh, that's what you usually do when you look for performance problems. So first layer, OSS to block devices. Uh, we tested block device performance with all sorts of tools. And it turns out that um, the, the graph shows the performance of the block device, of one of these block devices, that the performance is actually faster than, than uh, NetApp is advertising it. So we get uh, significantly more than 6 gigabytes a second out of the block device and 9 gigabytes uh, in write and 9 gigabytes a second in read. Um, we tested LNet. LNet self-test, um, or the self-test module, had to tune it a bit, but that was OK. We looked at the Luster client, tuned it a bit. Uh, those days, we used uh, Luster client 1.8. Uh, we looked at the benchmark, uh, took care of using stonewalling. This I would recommend to everybody who does I.O. benchmarks and cares about I.O. and not about uh, aggregated bandwidth of idle servers. But um, it turned out that we were seeing consistently something like 13 to 16 gigabytes a second instead of the expected 20. And the reason was in the InfiniBand fabric. Uh, the InfiniBand routing is static, which means every switch chip has uh, a route implanted for target, for a target, for a target lid uh, in the network. So what was happening, we were given a set of nodes from from inside these 3,000 nodes, the others were in production. And we, sh we were supposed to do the benchmarks on these nodes. And it turned out that the static routing 
was often uh, just using a subset of the links that, that we had available. So in this example, you see the, the red magenta links. Uh, they, they symbolize actually that on, on the left side we have two nodes, two compute nodes, which instead of using the two paths towards the Luster servers, we're just using one. And uh, at the same time, if you, if you think of the routing as a, as a target, routing um, uh, at switch levels, static routing, uh, you will know that um, uh, write cannot go over more than eight paths on, on the right-hand side. Uh, so even though we have 12 links, uh, only, we address only eight OSSs, so there are only eight, eight routes going towards these eight nodes. So, we could deal with this to improve the benchmark and to demonstrate that the storage system actually has the performance, but it is and remains a problem. And it's a big problem, of course, when doing benchmarks. Our task was to show the performance on 8 to 16 nodes. So what we did was we were given a bigger pool of reserved nodes out of, of what we got. Then we analyzed with the program um, the, the routes and uh, selected the nodes which had a minimal number of oversubscribed into switch links, links on the path towards the uh, file servers and the, the route back, because both routes are, can be different. So um, suddenly the performance was much higher. So uh, actually we, we reached more than we expected. We saw 24.7 gigabytes a second in write and 26 gigabytes a second in read. Uh, and an interesting fact is that uh, you need pretty many threads uh, for this type of storage uh, to, to reach the peak, its peak performance. That's a side note. So some trivial remarks to this. Well, uh, th this wasn't so before. So we didn't see this problem before, and why? Why? The reason is that uh, we are now using uh, storage devices of very high performance, and actually one OSS, uh, the performance of one OSS is at the order of magnitude of an InfiniBand link. So if, if you start over committing the links, you hit, you hit the limit, and you will, you will not see your peak performance. Uh, of course, the same way of integrating this is more expensive and more complex. That is uh, using LNET routers. Um, so we could have built it this way, but uh, that would have costed 30 uh, and more additional servers put into each of these islands, which is a significant additional <laughs> investment. So now to this has actually, this experience has inspired uh, the development of a tool. And uh, what, what we tried to do is to visualize, to detect and visualize the InfiniBand fabric. So first, uh, the, the first use of this tool is we detect the fabric and, and just look at it. And basically, if you have mistakes in the fabric, missing links or something, you will see when animating through, through, the, uh, through the links or through the connections that the pattern has, that some pattern has a mismatch. And the second, uh, the second use of this tool is to really display uh, the overcommitment in the static roots of the links. And that's roughly what it looks like. Um, if somebody's interested, I can show it on my laptop later in the break. Um, so what we can see is uh, we can select uh, jobs. So on the right-hand side, you see a list of jobs. Uh, there is one job is selected. Uh, when selecting one job, we see the nodes involved at the lower level. These are four nodes. Uh, can zoom in to see that there are really four. Uh, four nodes are collect connected to, well, to two uh, edge switches, and they are using four 
uh, core switches at the top level. So uh, although we have 18 core switches connected, only four of them are used. And the color of the links is, is uh, light blue. That means they are balanced. So in, in the language of this, uh, of this tool, uh, the links are balanced. That means uh, what we actually do is we count the routes going over these links from each of the node addressing any other node. So, um, and actually we count uh, write and read routes, so both directions. The ideal, the ideal situation would be to use eight core switches because each node here would address um, uh, two nodes on the other side with read and write, and it could actually use a link for read, another link for write. Here the links are basically both used twice, so we don't know um, which one is used uh, in which direction. That is, I mean, we know it, but it's, it's difficult to plot in this thing. So what we can see is whether a job has the full bandwidth or actually is balanced with respect to the bandwidth. Um, on the right side, there are two buttons, and the, the one button at the top is inside job, which shows the routes inside the job, and the, the second button uh, is called to LXFS, or to Luster, so that displays the routes when, uh, when the nodes communicate to Luster nodes. On the right-hand side, uh, now we have the Luster servers in the picture, and you see that when communicating to the Luster servers, some red dotted thick lines appear. Those lines are imbalanced links. Those links contain more than, more than uh, the expected routes for them. That means over those links, we will have over commitment, and that, will, that means uh, the performance will be slow. In, uh, or we, will, we are not able to get the, the peak performance for this configuration of the route. And uh, we don't do anything right now about the route. We could think of changing it. Um, there is a tool from, from uh, Mellanox, uh, UFM, you know it from Voltaire times, um, that, that is adjusting this route to some extent. So first of all, for us, this is a tool for benchmarking to understand the performance of benchmarks and, of course, understand the performance of user codes. If they complain something doesn't work well, then we can check whether it's, it's the uh, infinite manning. Currently, we don't attach more metrics to it, but it would be possible to attach uh, metrics, uh, bandwidth metrics, to each of the nodes. We, we just describe the nodes currently in the, in the graph. So this, all this is uh, uh, an application more or less running, mostly running in the browser. So it's nice and dynamic and, and zooming and whatever. So um, now to the other topic, and I'm glad I find time for this. So the other topic is bringing together cluster and luster metrics. To some extent, this is already, this was already doing it, but now uh, the classical metrics. So we do have luster servers organized, arranged in a file server cluster. And uh, in, in our setup, we have uh, ganglia configured in the luster cluster. So we actually have a set of standard metrics there for the servers. And we have own metric generators delivering metrics into ganglia and nagios. Then we have the cluster compute nodes. That's also OK. Usually, a cluster is also configured with some monitoring system. For us, this is, again, ganglia. So again, we have a set of ganglia-provided metrics, a set of self-measured metrics. Uh, InfiniBand ports, uh, we, we, we measure statistics of the, of the InfiniBand uh, port counters, create our own metrics, put them in ganglia. Um, that's pretty OK. InfiniBand routes, you've seen before, yes, we know how to extract them. We can, we can create them, or we can take them out of the, of the fabric. Um, we don't currently look at the inter-switch link statistics, but that is doable. Uh, there is a problem with InfiniBand metrics, uh, and 
classical monitoring systems like ganglia. The problem is that ganglia hierarchy is uh, done, is made for clusters. So the ganglia hierarchy contains a top level entity called grid, then in the grid entities called cluster, clusters, inside the clusters hosts, and inside the hosts metrics. That's it. So there's no really space for a switch and switch ports and this, this kind of things. So it doesn't quite fit. What about luster clients? Well, there are plenty of statistics of, uh, on the clients uh, about the luster performance of the clients and on the servers, on the luster servers. Um, often we don't have access to the clients and the users don't really like us to, to add any kind of additional metric generators on their compute nodes because that adds uh, OS noise into the compute nodes. So we try to avoid this. That means our choice is to really look at the Luster servers as much as possible. Um, Luster client metrics bring some scaling issues. Um, what's the problem? Well, uh, if just looking at bandwidths and, um, and transaction sizes, we have four metrics that are really of primary interest um, uh, with respect to Luster and clients per OST. These are the read, read bandwidth, write bandwidth, uh, read transaction size, write transaction size. Uh, four metrics coming per OST for, uh, well, the, the, the MDT metrics per client we can more or less ignore. There are order of magnitude, maybe 10 or more, but that's it. And uh, in a setup, in a moderate setup with 1,000 clients, 50 OSTs, that gives us 200,000 additional metrics for the monitoring system. That's pretty significant. Of course, the bigger the system, the more OSTs you have, the worse the situation. Okay, so that's, that's a problem. The, the second problem is uh, that ultimately we want to look at jobs and not at the single clients. Uh, or, or compute nodes. So the, the metrics of interest are actually per job. So what we, uh, what we want to do is to know which jobs are performing poorly such that uh, we, we can, we have a chance to find out why, advise the users, tune their code, uh, tune the file system, or add some OST pools specialized for their workload, or kill the jobs if they stall the file system. So. Extracting job metrics can be done in two ways. Currently, either we can map client nodes to jobs if uh, nodes are given dedicatedly to jobs, or um, we can use the newer tagging mechanisms provided by Luster where each RPC gets actually a job ID string. Both are okay and nice. Um, but which metrics do you want to keep for a job and which are... Uh, uh, how do you want to store them? Yeah, this is again a rather unusual uh, way of looking at metrics for the normal monitoring systems, which are geared towards looking at nodes, at the compute nodes, not at the at job aggregated metrics. So in any case, I told you we have some scalability issues, and uh, the solution to deal, well, the way to deal with this is, of course, aggregation of some sort. Uh, we need to reduce the number of metrics stored, and then, uh, we, we asked ourselves, do, do we need to care about each OST read-write bandwidth for each client node? Is that really of interest in, in finding out which, which job is, is bad? Uh, actually, no. Uh, so so what, what we do is, well, we aggregate, uh, we aggregate over the OST metrics. So we add up all the OST metrics to just have bandwidths uh, per client node. Uh, so that reduces the number of metrics by this factor of 50 in the example for the 50 OSTs. What about jobs? Um, in order to see whether anything goes wrong, do we need information on each compute node participating in the job? Of course, it's nice to have. Um, and we, we mostly have all these metrics because we store them anyway. In, in the systems, 
but um, can we see something if we have a thousand node uh, job, node running over a thousand nodes, how would we actually look at the data? Uh, do we draw 1,000 curves? Then you probably don't see anything anymore. So, um, so we, we, we're doing uh, some way of uh, aggregate. So we're aggregating these job metrics in a particular way that we learned from um, LRZ. We didn't use this before. And we learned it within a, a project, the FEPA project uh, that is uh, founded by the German Ministry of Education and Research. The following work uh, is, uh, has uh, been done in, within that project. So we use for uh, job aggregates percentiles, so-called percentiles. So instead of looking at every metric from every node of a job, we separately, we look at them all at once. So, for example, suppose you have a metric which delivers the example data uh, for each of the nodes, which is, which is in the uh, top row. Uh, if you, you can sort your data, and then you can get the percentiles. That means the zeroth percentile is the minimum value, the 10% percentile is the value at 10% in this sorted order, 20% is the value at 20%, and so on. And what you get there is uh, then the distribution of values, uh, a coarse distribution of values that you measured. That is, well, that is here in this diagram. So this coarse distribution of values is mostly good enough to find out what's going on in your job because it, and uh, now I did something wrong, what? No, sorry, <laughs> F5 or? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so the the setup for for uh, collecting this data has been built again with with ganglia tools, and um, I can say we're misusing somehow ganglia's way of aggregating and dealing with metrics for um, putting into ganglia also job metrics. So um, what, what we have in the setup is on the left side, on the left upper side, we have the Luster servers, uh, which has a G meta D, Ganglia G meta D with uh, metrics stored in the RRDs. On the lower side, we have the cluster with the resource manager. And uh, what on the client nodes, on, no, sorry, on the Luster server nodes, we have agents which are able to generate um, uh, the, the per OST last client metrics. So we have an orchestrator which triggers these generators to synchronously generate the per OST last client metrics and extract them from the last servers. They are being published to a separate GMOND, which is disconnected. So the GMOND is just collecting the data, aggregating it, keeping it, but not publishing it, and the, their time history is not stored. Uh, second step of the orchestrator is then to trigger the aggregation of client metrics. Uh, the aggregation of client metrics ends up then in the second GMOND um, uh, as, uh, well, the metrics end up there as aggregated client luster metrics. And uh, third step is creating these percentiles out of metrics that come from cluster, selected metrics coming from cluster, and these luster metrics and they are stored in a third GMOND. Um, three GMONDs, well, these two GMONDs are used as data source for a separate G meta D. Uh, so actually we have three data sources, three ganglia-like data sources. Uh, the visualization of this is done through LX Daemon, which I introduced uh, at the beginning. LX Daemon is, is uh, able to overlay these hierarchies and uh, address data from all three hierarchies through an XPath-like query language. It's, it's a, like, a, like a hierarchical database. And basically, uh, I, my time is over, actually. I'm, I'm finishing with, uh, um, with some, some screenshots or parts of screenshots from, 
from the graphical user interface of this. Um, here you can see uh, the hierarchies. On the left side, you see the grid hier Ganglia grid hierarchies. ELXFS is the grid. Um, uh, then uh, you can see percentiles and how, you, how they are actually useful metrics for looking at job. So this is job data. Um, this is uh, the double precision megaflops um, percentiles from a job, a particular job over time, over the time of the job, a runtime of the job. And you see that uh, most of the lines uh, are uh, gathered at the top, are running at higher performance. Two lines are below. That means that 10% of the nodes run with lower performance. So if these were 10 nodes, then one node is running with the lower curve, that's the lower bound, the minimum, uh, and one node is running with that light blue line, with the light blue performance. All other nodes perform well. Uh, by the way, uh, Megaflops extracted with the Liquid tool, which is developed in Erlangen, uh, uh, RZD Erlangen. Um, that's an example of overlaying, actually, cluster and luster metrics. Uh, not very nice to see the luster part, but it's small. It's on the right lower side. What you see is the, 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 the line with the spiked line is the uh, megaflops of average of a job. It shows uh, some, some spikes, which means that the job is computing something in a cyclic way, while all the percentiles of luster I.O. Right, right kilobytes per second are at the bottom at zero, so not, nobody is writing anything, except at the end when 30% uh, of the nodes seem to write something. Uh, they go up while the megaflops go down. Um, this, these are now, again, percentiles of a luster, luster job, luster read kilobytes per second. You see, most of the nodes don't do anything. That is the zero. The, the lines are, are gathered at zero. And 30% of the nodes, well, maybe 20% of the nodes do read uh, in, inside the job. So you can see here very clearly non-parallelized I.O. It's, it's easy to find out. Uh, or uh, things like power. Yeah, that's, that's another example. I like it because usually you don't look at power, but people care about power a lot today. And here we see that nodes are quite widely distributed around a certain number, while one particular node, or maybe two, or a percentage of, let's say, 10% of the nodes are very low in the power. So. At the same time, we, can, we have other views to overlay metrics from different data sources in order to find out correlations. These are then two graphs under each other with data from different sources. Um, that's, they can be zoomed at the same time, so they share the time scale. Uh, this way, we can try to see if there are correlations between some events. Um, finally, so. Um, Conclusion for now, well, InfinoN network from the first topic, well, even static metrics help understand the system performance. Uh, then uh, second part, there are too many metrics. Uh, you can't afford to store them all, so you need some sort of aggregation. I propose the way of uh, aggregating, which is not new. We didn't invent it, but it's, uh, we find it very helpful. And. Uh, we used the Ganglia infrastructure to aggregate all this. And it turned out to be quite flexible and helpful for doing this, but uh, GMetaD and uh, RRD database have their issues. I can tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>